Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Eddie Jennings from EJSLLC.com. This video is going to be another in my RHCSA practice session series where I'm not necessarily giving authoritative information, but rather I'm trying to show how I would prepare for particular objectives for the RHCSA exam. That being said, I do try to make the information as accurate as possible. The objectives for this particular video, this actually will be the first of two videos on install and update software packages from Red Hat Network, a remote repository, or from the local file system. I want to thank returning subscribers for watching another video and invite everyone, if you enjoy the content of the video, to make sure you click like. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure you click subscribe and ring the bell when you do so you can be aware of when new content comes available. So let's dive into installing and updating software packages. So this objective may seem a bit simplistic and from one perspective it is. There aren't really difficult commands to, to work with and a lot of the stuff is pretty straightforward. However, I think the challenge of this objective is you need to understand some of the differences in how software is installed and updated in a Linux environment compared to other environments such as Windows and Mac OS. The thing to understand is Linux primarily is working with packages and remote repositories of packages for installing software. And the tools that are used for that are going to be package managers. Now that doesn't mean there aren't packages available in Windows and Mac OS. As a matter of fact, Windows uses, I think, Chocolatey is a, uh, or that's one of the package managers available in Windows. And I think in the Mac world, Homebrew is used for packages. But unlike the uh, Mac and Windows world, you're pretty much always dealing with packages in the Linux world. Yes, you can install stuff by source, but for the scope of the exam, we're just going to be looking at packages. Also, I'm breaking this objective into two different videos. The video that's, that you're watching right now is going to be focused on YUM and DNF tools and dealing with uh, remote repositories. And then the second video, I'm going to go into the actual RPM tool. Also, you'll notice that I am working with Red Hat Enterprise Linux with this one rather than CentOS because the objective specifically talks about installing and updating software packages from Red Hat Network. And the easiest way for me to have access to that is by using an actual Red Hat Enterprise Linux operating system. So the tool we're going to be looking at is YUM as well as DNF. And really, these are two of the, the same things. I mean, they, they are two different tools. The Yellow Dog Updater Modified, I think, is what YUM stands for. I can't remember DNF off the top of my head. But they're the primary tools that we're going to use for managing packages on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And actually, you'll find that all of the Red Hat documentation talks about using YUM. But in reality, starting with RHEL 8, YUM is really kind of like just an alias for DNF. DNF is doing all of the work. And so in this video, I'm probably going to be using DNF more often than YUM, simply because DNF is what I'm using on my daily driver, my Fedora laptop. And so it's a little bit more familiar to me than, um, than YUM as far as Red Hat Enterprise Linux is concerned. So let's say you wanted to install Apache on your server and you really don't know what to do. You know that you have a command called DNF and DNF has a search option. So if you wanted to try to find Apache, what you can do is DNF search Apache. I'm going to get an error because I'm not doing this as a privileged user and Usually, you're not going to need privileges just to do searching, and, and the, the search is actually is not going to fail. It, it's, it's going to be successful. But I think what I might do is sudo into root just to where we won't have as many error messages and such um, happening. But you can see here that it found several different packages that are related to Apache, but the one that we're going to want is the actual HTTP server, which in the repositories for Red Hat Enterprise Linux is going to be the HTTPD package. So if we wanted to install that, let me clear my screen. I'm going to go ahead and sudo into root. Otherwise you would need to use sudo with the install command. Of course I fat finger it. There we go. Clear my screen one more time. So if I wanted to install Apache, I would simply do DNF install HTTPD. And that's it. Now it'll take a moment or so, but it'll search through the repositories and find it. And it asks us here if we actually want to proceed. Let's say that you're you know, working with a new system and you have several packages that you know you want to install. You can also 
pass DNF install the dash Y flag, which answers yes to all of your questions. So we're going to go ahead and tell this yes, and it will then install HTTPD as well as some dependency packages that or rather packages on which HTTPD depends in order to function properly. And after a few seconds or so, it completes and it tells you what was installed. And we can do systemctl status HTTPD, and we see that there is a service that's waiting there to be launched, and, and we have our HTTPD server. That in itself is pretty easy, I and mean, that kind of goes back to the original comment of, you know, this objective might not seem that difficult, but what's important to understand is how we get to this point. So the question becomes, how does DNF know where to search for packages? The answer to that is in our repo list. So if I were to do DNF repo list, what we will see are the enabled repositories for DNF. And so anytime you're doing a search or an install or an update command, you are going to be searching through and using these two repositories, the AppStream repo and the base OS repo for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, there are far more repositories configured for this system. They're just not enabled. So if you want to see all of the repositories about which DNF is aware, you would do this command. So DNF repo list dash dash all. And after a few moments, you'll see tons of repositories. Now, if you're doing this on a CentOS system, you're probably not going to see this many, and you'll understand why in, in just a couple of minutes or so. You notice that there are two that have been labeled as enabled. The others are, are disabled. So let's say that we wanted to enable one of these repositories. What we can do, we'll want to use our actual repo ID. You might be able to use repo name, but I always use repo ID when I'm working with this next command. So we're going to copy the this Ansible repository here. Let's clear our screen. So we're going to do DNF config manager. Is it config manager or manage config? Yep, it is config manager. Tab completion to the rescue, right? And we're going to do dash dash set enable and then feed it the repository name. All right, we didn't get any errors, so that's good. And if I were to do DNF repo list, we will now see that the Ansible repository has been added to the enabled repositories. So when we search for packages and such, this will be a part of what is searched. And, you know, when you're installing packages, likewise, this the packages in this repository are now available to us. You can also disable a repository if you need. Let's say that there is a repository causing a problem, and as a result, DNF is failing. Let's say it's not available anymore, and so when you search, DNF just fails, saying, hey, I can't talk to all of my repositories, so I'm just going to fail. You might need to disable the offending repository. So you would have set disable. Then you can use DNF repo list and confirm that the repository is no longer listed because it's no longer enabled. So now the question becomes, how is DNF even aware that these repositories exist? We understand that it uses these repositories to do its functions. We understand that you know not all repositories may be enabled. We understand how to list all of the repositories that DNF's aware of, but how, how do we even get to that point? And the answer to that question lies within the etsy yum.repos.d directory. Let's clear the screen. We'll go to etsy yum.repos.d directory. And we see there's a file here that says redhat.repo. Any file that is in this directory with .repo, DNF is going to be aware of and try to use to know about repositories to use. So if I were to vi into redhat.repo, what we see here is all of the configuration that, that you need for DNF to be able to work with a repository. Now, this file says that it's being auto-generated, and if you make changes, they'll be overwritten. The reason being is this is related to your subscription to Red Hat. 
that's one of the reasons why I chose to use actual Red Hat Enterprise Linux for this particular video is because in order to be able to get software from the actual Red Hat repositories, you're going to need to have your subscription active with your VM or physical server or whatever it is that you're using. I have a Red Hat subscription through their uh, development program. You, you can get a developer subscription that entitles you to a few instances of Red Hat Enterprise Linux for non-production stuff. And so that's how I'm able to do this for this particular video. But the things I want to draw your attention to is the, the basic structure of how the repositories are going to be configured. And this, this is important to know just because let's say that you're in the exam situation and the, there are no repositories enabled and you go into yum.repos.d and you know, there, there, there might not be a file there and you might be given the information of, all right, here's the name of your repo. Here's where the stuff is. Go forth and configure. Well, if you don't know what the anatomy of the, of the repo file is, then you'll be, you know, out of luck. Hopefully that, that not won't be the, that, that not, man, I gotta learn my English before I can do more videos, right? Hopefully that won't be the issue, but if it is, then you'll know how to make your own repo file. So we have the name of your repository and this actually, this is the, the, the repo ID is what's in our square brackets here. That also is what, um, delineates multiple repositories because you saw on that list, there were many, many repositories that weren't enabled, but only one, uh, red hat dot repo file. Now you don't have to put multiple repositories in the file, but you can, and this is an example of it. If I were to scroll down, you'll see another set of square brackets and that denotes another repository. So the repos are going to have a friendly name such as red hat enterprise Linux eight for x86 underscore 64 high availability it will have a base url and this is important because this is where dnf is actually going to reach out to to try to get the the information about packages as well as the packages themselves now this particular repository is not enabled notice enabled equals zero there and it does have a gpg check this gpg concept is important because it helps um, verify that the repository that you're talking to is um, who, who who it says it is. Like if, if, there, if there was a mismatch here, you probably would not want to use the um, the packages from that repository because your system is saying, "Look, stuff doesn't match. We don't know, you know, what's going on with these packages." You also have some options for SSL. The SSL options are not required, to the best of my knowledge, but if you're able to use them, why not? You know, doing stuff over encrypted tunnels versus non encrypted tunnels. For GPG check, I believe you do have to have GPG check either equal zero and not have a key, or if it's equal one, then you have to, to, to give it a key. If I'm wrong about that, feel free to put that in the comments, but I'm fairly certain GPG does need to be mentioned. One other thing I want to show you is with this GPG key, notice this says file colon and then slashes. If you have your GPG key stored locally on your system for this, then this is how you would tell DNF to look for this local file. The actual path to this file is at CPKI, RPM, GPG, on and on and on. So this isn't like you have root and then a directory under root named slash and then Etsy. This is simply file colon slash slash telling DNF that we're going to be looking to a, a local file on this system. And it is entirely possible as far as your, your, your repositories to, to have a whole nother file dot repo and, and have all of this information in it. So one question that has probably crossed your mind by now is before we enabled and uh, disabled that repo for Ansible, is that going to survive a reboot? Because remember, everything you do on the exam has to, to survive reboots. And the answer to that question is yes. And let me show you how that's going to work. So we'll get out of VI, clear our screen, and let's enable that again. I'm just pressing up because I wanted to get the name of the package because we're going to need this in a moment. We're actually not going to run this command. I'm going to go back into VI. We're going to search for this package name. And it has found it here. And notice that enabled is zero. So if we were to enable it now, 
Again, just pressing up to be able to get to the command that I want. And we VI back into Red Hat repo and search for the repository. Notice that the enabled is now equal to one. So when you're enabling the repository, really that's what you're doing. You're we're altering that Red Hat repo um, file and changing the enabled from zero to one. Thus, since that static file is being altered, this is going to to persist. Now. If you are in a situation where you have to manually configure your repositories, it's very important that you, you, you double check the information that you have there because if you have a mistake, in particular with the base URL, stuff is not going to work. So let's I'll show you that case in point here. Just something I discovered when I was doing some of my testing prior to making this video is there actually is a public thing from Microsoft that at the present moment is broken. So let me clear screen here. We're going to go into Firefox. I'm going to search for Microsoft Linux repo. And this is what I want. We're going to follow the instructions for configuring the repositories for Enterprise Linux 8. I'm not going to go into what RPM is doing right now. I'm going to save that for the second video of this. But we're going to copy and paste. We're going to remove sudo because we're already as root. There is no need to do sudo. And by installing this package, what this has done has added a Microsoft-prod.repo. So if we were to cat that out, we see that it's enabled, does have a GPG check, has base URL, friendly name, repo ID, and SSL verify equals one. So if I were to do my yum repo list, we're going to see it as well as the Ansible repository. And there we go. Unfortunately, PowerShell is not in this, this repo yet. But when I was doing my, my testing and I had discovered this, there is something that's called like AZ admin dash CLI. And so what we're going to do, clear the screen, we're just going to DNF search AZ admin dot CLI. And it's going to fail. And notice what the error is. It's saying status code 404. It can't find this particular um, XML document. And everything has failed. So the problem here is that Microsoft has a typo in its URL. And I think I know why 8.0 is there. Because for RHEL 7 and all the other versions, it, the actual URL is 7. whatever. So doing some experimenting, I realized that the 8.0 is the problem. So if I were to VI into that repo file, we're going to change 8.0 to just 8. And we're going to try the DNF search again. Notice we don't immediately have an error message. All right, and after a few minutes, it actually tells us no matches found, which I must have, have misspelled the, the name of the package. But the important thing is that the error message was gone because it can now reach that repository. So it's, it's, it's important that you're able to have the accurate information in the repo file. Otherwise, DNF and, and YUM as well would fail. So if we wanted to see what all the packages are in a particular repository, here's how we can do that. And this is what I'm going to do to find this particular package. So we'll clear our screen. We're going to do DNF. I believe the command is repository packages. Let's see if tab completion can help us out here. I believe that it will. Then we're going to give it the name, which of course I have forgotten. Hmm, how could I do this? I guess I could try this. Nah, that's not going to do what I want. What I want, cat, Microsoft. There we go. I need the repo ID. I was going to try to be clever and do a little subshell with LS, but that's not going to give me the data that I want. So let's try it again. DNF. Repository packages. Our repository package, I think. We'll see what tab completion tells us. It tells us packages. We do the repo name and then list. And after a few moments, it shows you all of the packages that you um, that are available 
in this particular uh, repository. And there it is, azdata-cli. I thought it was admin. So we're going to copy this here. And since one of the objectives is to install a package just from a remote repository, we're going to use this package. And just like with HTTPD, it's going to be searching through the repositories, and it'll ask us if we want to install it. Notice how the main package is coming from the Microsoft repository, but there are a couple of dependencies that actually come from the RHEL repository. DNF and YUM handle these dependencies. Uh, RPM will not. After a few minutes, it is going through the install. Actually, it downloads it, but then it warns us about the GPG key. This is completely normal, and what you would want to do is to, you would use the fingerprint for this to verify the key that Microsoft says is what they need, and if that matches, then all is good. I know that this matches, so I'm going to go ahead and choose yes. All right, and after a couple of minutes, it finishes installing. And so if I wanted to verify that this was installed, I could do DNF list dash dash installed. I'm going to grep for AZ data. And we see that it, it returns and it shows you what repository was used for gathering the package and, and installing it. So the other thing that's listed in the objective is to um, update packages. Now, right now, everything is, is up to date on my system, but let's say that I did a brand new fresh install of RHEL. One of the first things that I would do is DNF upgrade. And I usually do dash Y for this, especially for a clean install, because I want to go ahead and start out with all updated packages. And it's going to tell me that there's nothing to do because everything is already up to date. You can do individual packages with this, and if you also are working with module streams, you can do, um, I believe off the top of my head, it's DNF module update, and then whatever your module name is. So you can do everything with just DNF upgrade, or you can tell it individual packages to upgrade. Actually, as a matter of fact, let's try that. So DNF upgrade azdata.cli. Let's see what happens. Yep, and once again, it says that there's nothing to do because everything is already up to date. So I hope you found this video useful. There's not a whole lot of technical challenge with installing and updating software packages. Now, if you're having to do stuff from source, that, that is a greater technical challenge. But if stuff's already in a um, package, an RPM package in particular for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, this isn't too difficult to do. But I think the key for this objective is understanding some of these concepts and in particular how to configure DNF, YUM, and configure repositories to be able to, to get the packages that you want. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch. If you enjoyed the content of the video, make sure that you click like. And also don't hesitate to leave comments. Feel free to ask questions. I'll try to answer them as, as I have time and as, I, and as I have the ability to. Or if you just want to leave comments about the video itself or, or critiques, I welcome that as well. Again, I want to thank returning subscribers for watching uh, another video. And if you have not subscribed yet, make sure you click that subscribe button and ring the bell when you do so you can be aware of when new content comes available. Thanks again for watching and I will see you the next time.